Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. We are going to go to Psalm 46 this morning in our series as we have been going through different songs of the summer, if you will. Those psalms or songs or scriptures that we can't not sing, the ones that God has had in our minds and our hearts. And this one is familiar, and I want to begin by reading the first three verses of it. Psalm 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. I'll pause here for a moment. I want to stop here and just kind of sit in it for a moment and remember, and maybe I will just emphasize for all of us that this is who our God is. This is who he is. He is our refuge and our strength, our ever present help in time of trouble. This is who he is and you need to know it just as I need to know it. Not the knowing that you just know about it, but a knowing that settles in your heart and your soul. And knowing that allows you to sleep at night though there are storms raging. And a knowing that allows you to keep getting up and trusting God, keep showing up in the middle of a battle. This is who God is. He is unchanging. He is steady. He is faithful. His commitment and care for us is always dependable. He is good as we sang today. And can I just say, as we were singing you are good, good. I wonder how that lands in God's ears for us to be declaring his goodness with confidence together. I think it does move his heart. But I wanna pause here and I wanna talk about this for a little bit because I'm convinced that in these days that we live in right here and now, we need to know where our help comes from. We need to know who God is and who we are depending on and who we are leaning on. And see that his posture toward us, church, is yes. His posture toward us, as, as Liz was sharing earlier, and don't you love that we match today? We're, we're twinning, we thought about switching roles, but she could do this, I could not lead worship. Or I could, I don't think you want me to. But his posture toward us is a great big yes. He said yes to us before we ever earned that yes. In spite of the fact that we cannot earn his love and his care for us. Everything else in this world may fall away, but he is steady and sure and caring and ever present. He is a God of yes. He has said yes to you. The title of my message today is that, maybe I'm hinting at it, yes. In fact, the whole title is yes, what's the question? God comes for us and he stands toward us with a great big like, yes, you are welcome, you are received. And when it comes to creation or us as humanity, we see that he was in it, he was all in it before we qualified for his care or his attention. He was all in. We didn't earn it, but he chose us. He chose to create us, he welcomed us, and in case you have wondered, he is after your yes back to him. The response that he's after from us is, is a yes. It is a yes. What's the question? And we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm a little, um, not nervous. I'm just aware this morning that this, this message isn't necessarily like a, a super feel good message. I hope that it is. It should make us feel really good. But I am aware that in the times that we are living in and what we are facing today, it will require us as the church, God's people, to have a confidence that remains though we feel shaken. To respond to God with a great big yes, no matter what the circumstances are that we walk through, no matter what may rattle us, 
There is a yes, and you know what this looks like in your life. There is a yes that makes other yeses easier, and it answers the no's before they even come. Because we say, God, in the same way that you are all in with me, I'm going to respond and say, I am all in with you. So when we look and we begin today with Psalm 46, I want you to see who God is and what his heart looks like because it is that posture toward us. It is that care for us. It is that ever-present help in times of trouble that allows us as emotional, um, uh, all over the place, uh, frail, often weak physically human beings to say, God, you have my committed, complete, all in, wholehearted yes. And I wonder if we have undersold what he's after in the past. I think I personally have, and I repent. To say that it is just kind of, it's easy or simple or just always good to respond to God. It is, but you will go through challenges and shaking and trials. And he is worth it a thousand times over because it is in him that we find that steady that we need. I think maybe we have undersold the expectation in the past as the church and just said, yeah, just pray this prayer and it will be good. And that is definitely where it starts and it begins. But what he is after is your whole heart, your whole life, all of your attention, your calendar, your stuff, your priorities. He wants it all. And so let's quickly look through a few examples in scripture of how we see this response to God that actually does move his heart. I want to begin with Moses. Um, and we are going to go to the burning bush in just a moment, Exodus chapter 3. Um, Moses, as you probably know, is a complicated person like we all are. And he was somebody who, as a young man, had a pretty um, clear like certainty about what he was, what he was gonna do. He, we know when he was 40 years old, he saw something that was wrong, he witnessed an injustice, and he reacted swiftly, and he killed somebody. He had certainty, he was sure, he was called by God. There was leadership on his life from an early age. We see how God protected him as an infant, and he was raised in very um, unique circumstances. He was trained. He was educated. He was a man who, when he was younger, and I'm going to call him young at 40, and all the 40-year-olds should just say amen along with me, because when he, that is how old he was when he murdered this, this man. He, he was passionate. He was courageous. He had a drive for justice. And yes, he was foolish and impulsive. And we would say, no, that shouldn't have happened the way that it did. But he had a, a, yeah, a drive. And then we watch how his life kind of changes, how he goes into a wilderness season. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, hear I am. Could you all say that with me? Here, Here I, I am. am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Here, Moses is 80 years old. Still, honestly, midlife, because he was going to live another 40 years. So he's got some good years ahead of him. Actually, some very good years ahead of him. But by the time he meets God at the burning bush, he has lost his certainty. You can say that he is in a crisis of confidence here. He's lost his cockiness, but he has also lost his courage. He has quite literally been living in the wilderness. 
And as we stop to think about where he was in life, as God encounters him in this burning bush, I just want us to pause and think about our own lives because this is our lives too. We all find ourselves in wilderness seasons where we used to be very sure of what we were supposed to do maybe or what our calling was or what our life would look like. We had plans. Others had affirmed it. We knew what the future looked like. Sometimes there's a cockiness or a courage that comes with youth and that is a good thing. But maybe you've lost it. Maybe people have disappointed you and the ones that you thought you would run with for years are no longer with you and you kind of survey the landscape and wonder where God is and all of this. We find ourselves in wilderness seasons, whatever that might look like for you. We go through times of shaking and testing and Moses had as well. And that is all part of how God works in us. And obviously, God had Moses exactly where he needed him as he appears to Moses and he calls him from within a bush. And as we imagine that fire that Moses saw, of course he went closer and looked. I think we would. We always have the opportunity to either draw near or to run away. And sometimes we, you may run away. We might, may find ourselves running from that which is burning, from that which is holy, from, from that which draws us in the, the, the way that God speaks to us and he compels us and he draws us. But Moses draws near. And we, we see how in that fire there is an encounter for Moses. And this is true in our lives as well. When there is a fire, there is an invitation. There is a warmth. There is something that is, I don't know, it's it's otherworldly. You find yourself in the summer, we have like a little fire pit in our backyard. And isn't it funny how you all gather around it? You can't take your eyes off of it. It's, It's beautiful. There's nothing like a fire burning. But he here encounters God in the fire. And God is the fire that doesn't uh, burn up because God is already pure and perfect. There is nothing to be burnt away in God. But for Moses, there was some work to be done. There was a refining that was happening. Even as we sang today, even when we can't see it, he's working. Did we sing that today? We, talk, we prayed it earlier then. <laughs> Another great song. Um, There was a a refinement. There was something that needed to be burned away in Moses. He needed to be tested and he needed to be tried. In the fire, our nonsense is dealt with. It's all consuming. It burns away anything that is not pure or anything that is not gold. And what is pure and good and gold remains. And in this encounter with God, it's, it's familiar to us, but... We see how Moses is told to remove his shoes. God says, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And God is asking him to step out of what would elevate him, the the shoes that were kind of like a protection for him. He's inviting him into like a naked vulnerability. Take off your shoes. There's something going on here. This is holy ground as God is about to meet with him and speak to him. And we can like super spiritualize this, but I think there is something here for all of us to get, to grasp, to let it change us. That when God draws us and he compels us, he will ask us too to take off, to remove that which would separate us from him. He's inviting Moses to be real with him. There's something about being barefoot, and especially then in the presence of a holy God or someone that you honor and respect, that you are awestruck by. He takes his shoes off. Because God is inviting Moses, as we know, to walk with him, to, to share in revelation that God wants to give him. God is about to entrust Moses with something that is so precious. And before he can do that, there is an invitation for him to take his shoes off, to humble himself to surrender, to submit to God. Unless we take our shoes off or unless we allow ourselves to be completely real, honest, open, and vulnerable with God, he can't fully trust us or he can't fully um, entrust us with his thoughts, with his friendship, with his heart, 
with his plans, with revelation about what is happening beyond what we can see, which is his desire. We know that God is after friendship with us. That is his end game, that we would have communion, connection. But unless we can be honest, vulnerable, open with him, that doesn't happen. You know this is true in relationships, that unless there is a trust, Unless there is a vulnerability in your, your marriage or your closest friendships, you, you cannot trust that other person. And in fact, a relationship that hasn't gone through testing and shaking and trials cannot be trusted. You don't know if you can trust the other person until you've done some time with them, until you have seen them tested. You don't even know who you are yourself or what's on the inside of you until you have been tested. Do you know what I mean? It's after you go through some garbage and you remain committed walking together that you see that somebody else is trustworthy. Well, the same is true with us and God. He, he wants to entrust us. And so as we go through life, as Moses did, he goes through a wilderness season, then he counters God. God is always drawing. He's always compelling. And yet it is our decision. It's always up to us. Are we going to trust him? Are we going to pass the tests that we walk through? He, he wants to know us. He wants to be known by us. But in order to really know God, we have to let him confront our fear of anything other than God himself. He will do that over and over again. So rather than resist it or run from it, I want to encourage us to be a church that takes our shoes off and that surrenders to him, that opens our hearts to him. And we watch Moses do that. His response to God here is, here am I. His yes turns this wilderness into a place of promise, holy ground, death to life. And this phrase that Moses uses here, which is translated, here am I, is a, a Hebrew phrase. It's found 17 times in the Hebrew scripture. It is uh, a word that we see a few times. We see Moses use it. We see Abraham use it. We, we see Samuel use it. Here am I, Hinene. It was the response that Abraham gave God when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. Remember that story? One that offends us so greatly. How could God ask Abraham to put his son on an altar, prepared to sacrifice his son that he loved so much? It offends us, and I actually think that it is supposed to offend us. And as God asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham responds to God, and he says, God, God calls him, and he says, here I am, Henene. And we watch in that story as Abraham's faith filled, yes, Abraham, who is known as the father of our faith, it turns that sacrifice into hope because God says, because you were willing to sacrifice Isaac, I, I trust you. I see your heart. I've tested your character. And so then God goes on to walk with Abraham. And in fact, right after that, he promises Abraham that through Isaac, there will be generations to come and blessings upon those generations, because Abraham's response was, here I am. And then Samuel, in a very different circumstance, both Moses and Abraham are like old men, middle-aged, old, older. All of my definitions of age are changing as I age, by the way. <laughs> 48 is like young, all of a sudden, right? The, the, the young, young ones are upstairs, so we can just all like adjust our scales for today. But Samuel was a, a young man. He, he was young, young, a child. And it was before he really even knew God. He, he knew what it was to serve in the temple, to serve Eli the priest. But God calls Samuel. And his response, as God first calls him, he thinks that it's Eli calling him, but he says the same thing. He says, Hanene. Here I am. And we watch as through Samuel's life, his yes to God 
turns a young kid's life, a life of insignificance into resonance because Samuel was given a voice that carried weight, that meant something. God spoke to him and through him. 1 Samuel 3.19 tells us that the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. It says that all of Israel recognized that God spoke through Samuel and that God revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And this phrase that I've referenced a few times, it's an expression in Hebrew that is complex. And it, it means not just here I am, it doesn't mean I am here, but it means, like I said before, it means yes, what is the question? It means I am here, but it is an uh, existential uh, expression. It is to say I am all in. It is to show up, if Rod was to call me, it, was, it would be me saying, yes, what can I do for you? What are you thinking? And to be willing to do and to go with whatever he may be thinking, which could be scary. And it often is when it comes to God. But it is an expression of, of trust, of yes, I am all in. It is an offer of total availability, a fully engaged presence. It is an unguarded affirmation. It is to say yes with, without including any clauses or any discussion of what will be uh, coming after the yes. It is, it reminds me of like the, the, the vows we make, the promises that we make in marriage where we say yes and when we are married in today's day and age, we do a little research first, right? Like we, we know one another. I have an, an idea of what I am getting into, but when I say yes, then I am willing to go with whatever because now there is a covenantal relationship. It makes me think of that because it is a surrendering, a submission. It is a yes with no clauses, no, no prenup. I'm all in. I'm here. What can I do for you? What would you ask of me? What is the question, God? And this is what God loves to hear. He loves to hear this, yes. He responds to it. We live today in times, as you know, of complexity and chaos. Um, leaders, those that we, we look to for strength and courage and certainty, they are being chewed up and chewed out. We have conversations in recent days about like, who would want to be a leader unless you know God has called you? Whether it be a pastor or somebody leading politically, like why would you? I don't know, you have to be either crazy, uh, and I'm not saying people are crazy, I'm just saying maybe that could be an option, or you have to know that you know that you know that you're the person for that job, I would assume, in these days. And the church especially needs leaders, but not just leaders who get up on a platform. To be a leader is to carry influence. It's to be a person who has a surety and a confidence. And it cannot be a surety and a certainty and a confidence in your own skills or strength or ability because that will be challenged and rattled. It must be a confidence in someone greater than us. And the church today has this unique call on us, we know this, to shape culture, and yet it can feel as though culture is shaping the church, that we have to cater to what is being pressed upon us. And we have a unique call today to speak truth to power, and yet there are, there are powers that seem to be muting or, or uh, threatening the voice that we carry. And again, it's, it's surely not my voice, but it is the voice that God gives us. It is the confidence that comes from God and his word and the scripture that we cling to. The, wor the world around us needs leaders that have and live in a fear of God a trust in God, a resting in God, where he has our yes. 
where he has our whole heart, where we have said yes to him. And so that makes saying yes to other opportunities or challenges or trials or conversations easier. And it makes saying no to certain options easier because he has my whole yes. He longs for that. In fact, it is what he asks of us. Are you guys doing okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, he responds to our yes. Second Chronicles 16 tells us the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. In other translations, it says that he is there to fully support those or to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him or whose hearts are perfect toward him, whose hearts are fully devoted to him. This is the yes that he is looking for. He's looking for friendship. He's looking for communion. He's looking to share his heart with us. He is looking for a bride that won't look away. A bride that won't stray when there is a confrontation or where there is a attempting other offer. He's looking for that, that communion with us as his church. And so that challenges me deeply because I have to ask myself as I present this to all of us, do we say yes to him? Are we saying, yes, God, what are you asking of me? Because I'm in, whatever it is, I am here, show me. Yes. It means that we have to long for him more than we long for comfort. Long for him more than we long for security. We need to want him more than we want the future that we are planning or counting on. More than we long for a nice group of friends who always get along and who always support us. We must long for him more than any of those things. Long for him more than we want the good gifts that come with walking with him. It's about him, him first, him always. And the reason I started with Psalm 46 is because I want us to see that God says this to us. That God says, here I am to us. He is present to us. He turns toward us. He is for you. Scripture is the story of God saying yes to us before we say it to him, before the question is asked, before it even comes into our mind. And when we read throughout our Bible, what we see is that God's here I am toward us is his gracious acts of mercy, of grace, it is him entering into covenant with us, covenanting with us broken, fragile people in a way that costs him dearly. It is God turning toward us, announcing a covenant with us, and the brunt of it he always bears. We can get so distracted so often and think that it's on us. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm sacrificing. But God is always the one who extends and gives. If we ever question that, we look at the cross and we see what an all-in kind of love looks like, hey? All in. Everything for us. I would love to read Psalm 46 one more time. And in fact, if I, could, if I could, if you are able to stand, would you stand with me and we will read it together. And the worship team is going to come and join because in just a few moments, we do have an opportunity, as we always do, to respond to God himself and to respond to the word that he has given us today. So as we read Psalm 46, let it remind you, let it fill your, your thoughts, your mouth as you speak it, and your heart with the goodness of God. It is up on the screen. I will lead you, and let's read this together. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. 
God is our refuge and strength, never present help in times of trouble. We're going to read it one more time. There you go. Um, I must have done this. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Reading through this psalm, we might picture like a tsunami as we read about and over and over again about the mountains falling into the heart of the sea or the waters roaring and foaming. But the threat that was illustrated here would have landed with even greater strength and resonance to the original listeners because the, the shaking of mountains would represent the undoing of creation. The mountains were understood to be the pillars that were holding up the sky, anchoring the dry land. And so, reading through this psalm and as we read it today, what we are really declaring is that even in the midst of a cosmic threat, we trust. Facing instability, whether it be economic or political, Relational, nations and kingdoms in chaos, we trust, we say yes to God. Because God is who he is, we can trust, we can say yes fearlessly. Uh, Spurgeon called this a song of holy confidence. So I want to encourage you to read it and reread it and let this be our song of the summer, a song of holy confidence. Confidence in God, the God who says yes to us first. Wherever you are at in life today, God is after your yes. That is what he wants, to be clear. A yes that doesn't have any clauses attached. Or I'm in if it looks like this or this but a yes that is completely, wholeheartedly his. He's after our yes. You may be here today and maybe you are like Moses, like in some sort of a crisis of confidence where you feel like you're wandering. You've been in the desert. You've been isolated perhaps or disconnected. Today is a good time to, to say yes to God. Or I think of Abraham, who, yes, the father of our faith, but do you know, before Isaac came, God had given him a promise in his old age that he would have children, that there would be many who would come from his line. God had taken him out of his tent and shown him the stars and said, you will have descendants like the stars and the sky and the sand. And then he had a promise from God. He had something to hold on to, but it took time took more time, obviously, than he thought it was going to take. And so Moses and his wife, they kind of just took matters into their own hand and decided to have a child with another woman. That wasn't God's plan. That wasn't how he was leading them. And even the father of our faith, he, he wasn't perfect. So you may be here today and maybe you feel like you have messed up. You have made decisions that are like beyond what God can work with as if any one of us is beyond what God can work with. Or you may be here today and maybe like Samuel, you're, you're young or you don't know God personally yet. I want to tell you wherever you are 
in life today. Today is a good day, and it is the right time, and I, I do feel an urgency to remind all of us and encourage all of us that today is a good time to say yes to God, an unqualified yes. You can trust Him. Will you trust Him? Will you say yes to Him? Because He does want to entrust you with revelation, with His heart, with what He is doing. He wants friendship with you and I. He desires intimacy. He wants our whole heart. He's all in. So we have the ability to respond. And I wonder today how we will respond to his call. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.